Hello, Pastor Patrick Hines here, and I want to start a series of podcasts uh, walking through passages of, of Scripture. And uh, I've preached through Romans. It's been a few years. Uh, I did a lot of work uh, in the book of Romans, and I'm still working on editing those sermons uh, for publication. Uh, I've been working on my Nehemiah sermons, uh, almost, almost done with Nehemiah to get it out in a book. Uh, for those that uh, want to read my exposition of that, but the exposition and teaching of Scripture is really the the life work of, of a pastor. That's what we, we spend our time doing uh, is reading and studying the Bible and trying to teach it. So I wanted to have more outlets for that and try to make these videos maybe 10, 15 minutes long each and keep them a little bit shorter, uh, just so there's consistently time being spent in Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, I've got the versions up here, and this is Bible Works 10.0, and that's the New King James Version. The next one there is the New American Standard, Young's Literal Translation, and then I've got the uh, Critical Text, and then the uh, Majority Text here, and this, it's highlighting the uh, differences, if there's ever any differences or textual variance between those. But with that, let's go ahead and dig right in here. Romans is uh, a very important book <clears throat> of Scripture because... Uh, it appears to be somewhat occasionless. It doesn't seem like there was a specific issue there in the church in Rome uh, that Paul is trying to correct or address. I mean, certainly there were issues that were everywhere, always the, the Judaizing tendency of trying to add things to the finished work of Christ, Jewish laws and ceremonies, the Mosaic law. And Paul, of course, hammers that um, point very hard uh, in the book of Romans. Uh, but I want to just start walking through the text and uh, make some comments along the way here and just uh, teach what the what the passage says. Okay, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now, Paul uh, was the last apostle that was chosen. He was not one of the original uh, 12. He, he was not there uh, for Jesus' earthly ministry. And Paul, as we know from other places, was uh, a Pharisee. And so he was an expert in the law, and he was a very zealous man. He was a very dedicated individual. This guy was no uh, fence walker. He was not a liberal. Um, he took his convictions very seriously, and he understood the concept of antithesis. He understood that if something was true, then that which is contrary to that must by necessity be false. And that's why he was such a vicious opponent of the Christian faith. Uh, and you see it there in Acts chapter 7 uh, when Stephen is martyred. Um, the, the people that stoned Stephen to death laid their clothes and their, their garments down at the feet of a young man named Saul. It's a, it's a very stirring passage there at the end of Acts chapter 7. And then uh, more havoc and persecution of the church is in Acts chapter 8. But then in Acts chapter 9, in the opening verses of Acts 9, is uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the apostle Paul. And as we know about his background, uh, he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the great teachers, one of the great rab rabbinic teachers of the time. And so uh, Paul had a great pedigree. Uh, in fact, we know from Philippians chapter 3 that Paul even knew what tribe he was descended from. He was a, of the tribe of Benjamin and a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So he was circumcised the eighth day. So this guy had all the boxes checked. Um, but he did not understand grace, and he did not understand the role of the law uh, in the Old Testament uh, covenant of grace. He just didn't understand it. He thought that the law uh, was that by which, if you obeyed it, you could be right with God. And, of course, in one sense, he was right about that. If you do obey the law, you can be right with God by that. But as, he, as he's going to spell out here in Romans, uh, no one is able to do that uh, because of the fall and because the first Adam failed to keep the covenant of life, the covenant of works, and failed to obey it. Um, we have to have someone else uh, keep that covenant in our behalf, and that's what justification is all about. So Paul is called as an apostle. And to be an apostle, uh, you had to uh, be appointed directly by Jesus Christ. You also had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, and um, you had to be uh, set apart by the Lord for that purpose, which Paul certainly was. So he was called to be an apostle, and he was separated to the gospel of God. And really, that's not uh, the gospel about God. It's the gospel of God in the possessive sense, God's gospel. So that's an important point, especially for pastors and, and really all Christians to remember. This is God's gospel. 
Okay, it's, it's God's gospel. He's the one who defines what it is, and whether we like it or not, uh, the gospel is what God says it is, and the gospel is justification by faith alone, completely apart from works. That's what Paul uh, taught very emphatically, very clearly. He's going to teach that here in uh, Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and the rest of the book, and also clearly in Galatians, uh, that the gospel is that we are justified forensically, legally, judicially, before the law of God at the final judgment by faith alone in Christ alone. That is to say, we are justified by the righteousness of Christ alone. That's why we, we um, emphasize so much that we're justified sola fide. What, what justification by faith alone is really shorthand for is justification by the righteousness of Christ alone. Okay, verse 2, which he promised, the God's gospel, which he promised through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, we'll just stop there for a moment. The gospel is not a new covenant uh, revelation. As we know from many passages in scripture, uh, the gospel is very much there in the Old Testament. Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed Yahweh and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So Abraham was justified by faith and not by anything that he did. Um, and it was by faith alone in the coming of Christ alone. The gospel is there in the Old Testament. It's very much there. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 8, that Abraham himself had the gospel preached to him. And so the gospel is promised there in the Old Testament. And it's foreshadowed through the types and through the sacrifices, through Passover. I mean, Paul even calls Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So you see the gospel illustrated and foreshadowed uh, in types and, and prophecies and everything else uh, in many different ways uh, there in the Old Testament, no question about it. And so the gospel was promised in the Holy Scriptures, meaning the Old Testament Scriptures, about Jesus Christ concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, that's his, his physical genealogy, his, uh, the genealogy of his humanity, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now, what you see here is a fully developed biblical Christology, right here, uh, in Romans chapter 1, the first, verses 3 and 4, that Jesus is the Son of David. He's the Son of David, um, according to the flesh, according to his humanity, and declared to be the Son of God, according to his divinity. So Jesus Christ is one person, with two fully intact, distinct natures. The, the human nature and the divine nature are united together in the one person. And it's uh, remarkable to me that right in the opening, in the greeting of <laughs> Romans, you have clearer Christology uh, than many people have um, who've been Christians for a long, long time. And this is where we just have to drive ourselves back to the text here and just look clearly at the passage. He's of the son of David who was uh, born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now the opening verse of the New Testament, uh, always think of Matthew 1 verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so immediately reading the New Testament, the opening verse there in the first book as um, the canon of scripture has them listed, Matthew's gospel, it's a genealogy of Jesus. People wonder all the time, why are all these genealogies everywhere in the Old Testament? Why are these so important? Well, they're important because of the promise that God made Abraham. The gospel promise is from Genesis 12, verse 3. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, Abraham understood what, he, what God meant by that. He meant one of your descendants is going to be the seed of the woman. One of your descendants is going to be the Messiah and the Savior through whom all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Not just your physical descendants inheriting the land of Canaan or anything like that, but all the families on earth will be blessed in this descendant. And God said the same thing to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one of your descendants will sit on the throne forever. And in fact, when the angel um, is explaining this um, in Luke chapter 2, I believe it is, um, the throne of his father David, he says there, that's in Luke 1, excuse me, Luke chapter 1, um, Behold, you will conceive in your womb, this is the angel uh, speaking to Mary, and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So according to his humanity, Jesus Christ is a descendant, 
a physical descendant of David. And this is why you see oceans of innocent bloodshed all around that genealogy, all the way through uh, the Old Testament. You see the devil trying his best to snuff out uh, that line. That's why you see all the murder uh, of the, the uh, Jewish children, of uh, he Hebrew Israelite children there in Egypt uh, by the command of Pharaoh. It's, it, that's the devil trying to destroy the line to the Messiah because the devil knows it's going to be through this line that the one is coming who's going to crush his head. Okay, so Jesus will be given the throne of his father David according to his humanity and yet we also know that Jesus is the son of God. Uh, let me find the passage here uh, that uh, John the Baptist uh, yeah, quotes from. Uh, John the Baptist, when he comes preaching, he, of course, is the final Old Testament prophet. He comes and speaks and uh, preaches a baptism of repentance for remission of sins. And in Luke 3, verse 4, it says, he says, As it is written in the book of, uh, of the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and that's the, the Greek word kurios, which is a translation from the Hebrew there from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, of Yahweh. John the Baptist understood that the one coming after him was God himself. He knew that he was preparing the way for the coming, not of just a descendant of David, mind you, but the coming of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord, of Yahweh. Okay, so John the Baptist himself understands that the Son of God is coming, that this, this individual, this, this one um, who's going to appear on the scene, uh, even though John the Baptist is a few months older than Jesus, uh, he recognizes this is the Lord himself. I am preparing the way for the coming of Yahweh in human flesh. Okay, so back to Romans uh, chapter 1. Let's back up just a little bit here. We'll just put the full text here. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. God told Adam, I'm going to send the seed of the woman. One of her descendants is going to crush the devil's head and undo all this mess. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And so Jesus Christ will be of the seed of David, and he will be the son of God. Two distinct natures in one person forever. And Christ, by his righteousness, is going to accomplish and achieve the good news. The good news is not something that you and I do. It's not something we, quote unquote, live out. The gospel is the accomplishment of the Lord Jesus, as it says there in the theme verses of Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And we'll get to these here soon, but I just want to read them. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And by the way, if it's from faith to faith, it's by faith alone. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation. Why is it the power of God to salvation? Because in the gospel is revealed the very righteousness of God, which is a free gift given to us by faith alone, by which we are justified before God. Um, and just one more passage that illustrates this well, Romans 5, 17. For if by the one man's offense, that's Adam's, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. What are you trusting in to get you into heaven? Are you trusting in the gift of righteousness or are you trusting in what God is doing subjectively in your heart? If you're trusting in that, if you're trusting in your own progress, your own sanctification, your own good works, Viewed under the auspices of grace, you're not a Christian. Christians trust in this, what Paul talks about here. This, the gift of righteousness. Have you received that? Do you have on your legal account the gift of the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel? I hope and pray you do. And I look forward to seeing you next time as we walk through scripture just a few verses at a time. Thanks for watching or for listening.